that we want to always remember is, is that with the development of strabismus, is it really something that's occurring at birth in regards to congenital in origin, or it may be infantile in origin? And I'd just like to give you a little bit of background information how uh, about how this meeting came about. About uh, two years after I graduated in '86, we had a study group meeting, or OEP group here, and Nancy Torgerson shared with me a uh, article on uh, Dr. Rethy that had been shared with her from Dr. Friedman. And that started getting some things churning in my head, and from that point we went ahead and uh, I started diving in and doing a couple literature searches, found a few more articles from, and then I moved to California. And then suddenly the thinking process started up again about a year, year and a half ago. And I started thinking, I think I should write him and just see if we can find out what's going on. So we went ahead and uh, I wrote a letter to him, and he was very open to discuss uh, the concept of prevention of strabismus rather than just letting it start and uh, develop. With that in, uh, in mind, um, we've been corresponding for about a year, year and a half now. And Dr. Rethi has just gotten done uh, being at the International Strabismus Association meeting in Vancouver. And he has come down here to visit and to share with us today some of his thoughts about prevention of strabismus. So with that, I'd like to introduce a very good friend of mine, Stephen Rethi. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to me to hear uh, these uh, words, and it is a pleasure <coughs> for me to speak to you, and I hope you will enjoy, and I am inviting you to discuss uh, about everything, what you think uh, should be or should not be done. So let us start. There are two main directions in strabology, the conservative and the surgical treatment. And it was about 5% which allowed to the conservative treatment. My own experience was that about 85% were conservative treated. And all the others have been treated surgically. And now the new uh, method, the preventive method, deals with about almost 100% of all the squinting population. It's only requirement that it has to be much earlier than either the conservative treatment which was uh, starting about one or two years of age, or the surgical method, which is uh, still very controversial, starting very early or starting very rarely, the results are in both cases not sufficient. Congenital isotropia cannot be cured. It is incurable. But if something is incurable, it must not be unpreventable. And this is perhaps the most important. And there are also other aspects. Should be the prevention a chance left for some <coughs> people only? Or should be it a duty? If we know that the prevention is working well, then at least the information should be a duty for those people who are thinking that the prevention is the best method to cure strabology, uh, to cure strabismus, which I hope to show you perhaps in the next few hours. So it looks something like this. Some people are going this way off the beaten path. And it is the question, how many can be attracted to this way? And then it will be changing. I don't know whether it will be in my life or 
Later on, mostly, it is done when the author is already dead, that the matter will be famous. Now let me start. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, and this in the pocket. Or put it here. Yes. Yes. This is the window in my practice in a <coughs> winter day. The infants and <coughs> children are seeing it is not so dangerous as it, <coughs> as it is. And here is the baby who is wearing the first glasses in her life. <coughs> Mother is astonished because it's quite different how the, the smallest baby babies are reacting on the glasses. I asked the mother, <coughs> holding the glass in my hand, of the measurement of the cycloplegic refraction, and perhaps it is six degrees or so, and asking the mother, what will be <coughs> the reaction of your baby? Oh, she will throw it away. Now look, and then we are trying, giving the glasses for the baby, and the baby is astonished, and looking around, how is it possible? And the mother is perhaps crying because she was having a baby quite normal and now she should have a baby with glasses. But then we are telling it's only temporary. If you are accepting now the glasses, then the wearing of the glasses will be the shortest because the most dangerous age is now the most <coughs> active and most sensitive development. And what is the problem with the baby? The refractive error is always conatal. The genes are not knowing about squint, about amblyopia, they are knowing only how should the eye have a form, which form should be have the eye, the face, everything, on the millimeter or even <coughs> less than a millimeter, exactly inherited. And we have to look what is inherited in the baby. And our experience is that the most refractive errors are inherited in squint families. Not all babies should be looked at two or three months age, but the babies from the families where the mother or the father has been operated for squint or has an amblyopia or something <coughs> which we know is a squint family. And these babies are Every second with a high hyperopia or with a, with a astigmatism. And if we can detect it and give a glass, it is about <coughs> one in 30 babies who should wear a glass and then will be the, uh, the morbidity of strabismus regress. Why? It is so. Hypermetropia is not the cause of strabismus. As many have been thinking, hypermetropia is the only cause. No, hypermetropia is a stimulus. What is what's the stimulus? The blur. We will have. You see, here is also the window, now in a, in a friendly day. And here, the first glasses are sometimes given like this, with a, with a round holding apparatus. And later on, it can be a normal glass going around like this.
So now <coughs> here's the baby who is squinting already at this age. Why is he squinting? Because <coughs> is it readable? No, it is. Uh, the, the writing is uh, is not readable because it is the opposite. Now we have the baby who is having blur. Every baby has has a blur at a certain near distance. We need an accommodation. And if the blur is everywhere, near and far, then the accommodation, which is stimulated for near, can be also stimulated for distance. Now everybody can it try. If I look at my finger here, I accommodate and I have to converge. And if I look at you with the same manner, using my near accommodation to look at you, what I am having, is it an indication for surgery? Before it is so, I stop it. And so we can help the baby also <coughs> when he is starting with the intermittent, intermittent, squinting, then it is highest time to give the glasses. It is already not completely preventing everything. It is preventing the stimulation. Further stimulation is now eliminated with the glasses. And the intermittent squint without the fusional check could already provoke some suppression. This is already too late for prevention. And then we have to treat against the suppression. It is already starting with intermittent isotropia. Now this is the problem. How can we detect intermittent isotropia? The parents are telling that <coughs> infant was squinting yesterday evening and before and getting longer and longer. Not in some, not uh, for some seconds only, because this is a baby screen. Everything should be tried. My screen is also a baby screen, you see, because I can stop it in some seconds. If it is a minute and still squinting, then the provocation of the suppression is already in the brain going on. And what to do if the doctor is seeing the baby and there is no screen? There is with covert as nothing to see, and uh, the parents are telling he was a, a child was squinting, and this was my paper which I got rejected in Vancouver, that you can make the baby looking at some bright object going nearer and nearer. If the suppression is still there, it will act at this near point. One eye is going more into convergence, over converging, or coming back, one eye is left, and only one is coming out, and if the object is about so far, then is coming with a sudden movement also the other eye, because now we are out of the suppression area, and the eye is converging again without suppression. The fusion is recovering. And in such cases we are giving, in any case, the full correction of the refractive error. Is it two or is it eight? It is the same. The start of intermittent isotropia is the indication for immediate refractive error correction. And uh, the babies are accepting their glasses best at this age. If you have experience with six months old and older ones, then you are perhaps afraid, how can you, can you give glasses for such small babies? But if the one-year-old are tigers, then these are the lambs. They are accepting everything. And perhaps a week later, we should, or two weeks later, 
we should look again how is it uh, the most important thing is not the diagnosis of the hypermetropia, is not the diagnosis of squint or not squint. The most difficult thing is, in my experience, to speak with the parents and to tell them that if you want, then the baby will wear the glasses. And who is doing the, the treatment? You are doing the treatment for the baby. And I'm giving only advice. And I will give you advice any time you need it. But the treatment is done by you. So it takes sometimes half an hour in a busy ophthalmic practice when we have only <laughs> minutes for every patient. And so I lost many of my old patients with macular degeneration because I told I'm not <coughs> looked upon uh, um, so as I would like, because I am not squinting. And <laughs> the babies have been more time. They need it, the parents. And so we can prevent, I suppose, all exclusion when one eye is suppressing without alternation when one eye is uh, amblyopic already, and the worst of all, the Sciencia syndrome. It is not proven, sure. You have to prove for yourself. I am only showing <coughs> how to do it, how to try it. Now he is also, perhaps we can go but I'm afraid every, how oh, this is, my, my method. Yes. Yes. Are you going to speak about it? No, Sianzia was giving a, a <coughs> at Vancouver a big uh, Kostenbeda lecture. The main symptoms of Sianzia syndrome are big angle, Abduction is limited, even not present. Abduction, pseudoparesis of abduction, nystagmus in abduction, torticollis, looking only with one eye, and uh, the, it is uh, moving the head, and it is incurable. But all of this is caused by the first step of adaptation to squint, the first step, suppression. And if the suppression is getting more and more and, and uh, permanent, you can have amblyopia, you can have the big angle, and uh, the abduction <coughs> is due to is a, a law of uh, <coughs> innervation. When the internus is getting a very strong impulse, then the opposite partner, the abduction, is getting a very strong inhibition. And if it is not treated, the inhibition will be so strong as it is uh, an abduction paresis. But this is only a pseudo paresis. So it is uh, seen that every symptom of the Sciencia syndrome is an adaptation syndrome, but irreversible adaptation already. It is not uh, reversible, even if it is symptomatic. The brain is not accepting any, any uh, other solution. It's only the monofoveal fixation. And <clears throat> some of the symptoms can be alleviated, but it is incurable. Now, why should we give the glasses so early? Because the brain has its own sequence of behavior. 
The brain programs have a succession. And I think, and perhaps you agree with me, the first and most important program is the program of the eyes. And if the sight is blurred, then it will be <coughs> chosen perhaps a monophoveal way without any pathology at start. It is the normal eye of a normal baby with a perhaps normal refractive error which is inducing the brain not the, give up the fusion, make suppression in one eye and to use monophoveally the eyes. It is much easier than to work with both eyes. But if it is introduced at this sensitive critical age, it is remaining for whole life. If the squint is not started at this age, only later when the scramble is beginning, locomotion, working, and at last speaking, then the development of the vision of the bifoveal side is already having some time when it was normal. The prognosis is always better and better when the squint is starting later and later. And the opposite is also when the squint is starting, the earliest squint start, what I have seen, was at the third week of life. It is never congenital. Only the parents are told, your baby is <coughs> squinting since birth, then they are accepting it. But if you ask, have you seen the eyes of the baby at birth? No, I didn't see. When did you see at first? Perhaps it was already the third day or the fourth. Was there squinting? No. Then one was the first. And so you can trace up one was the first crossing of the eyes. How long was it? Perhaps at first very short. Later on, it will be more and more. Why will be it more and more? Why is it, is it getting more prolonged, prolonged? Because the suppression is stronger than the fusion. The suppression is protecting the brain against the very much disturbing isodeviation. And the <coughs> fusion is not so strong to overcome it. If the child is giving up and not and, uh, and not wanting the sharp focused images, then the squint is over the danger of isotropia. If the child is giving up, he is not wanting uh, sharply focused images then it can be the isotropia eventually. Now we see the blur is a the stimulation for far distance always, also corrected by glasses. The intermittent isodeviation should be then stopped. You see here is already the squint not disappearing with glasses. The first glasses given early enough cannot relax the convergence used for distance. What is the squint angle? Isotropia angle. It is convergence used, the near convergence used for distance also, for far distance. Now you can see, that is blur. It is irritating for everybody. And it is also irritating for the baby. You want to, to see it focused. You see, 
Trabismus relief. Is it urgent or no? Urgency. And causal treatment means urgent relief. Surgery, it is another thing. This is the same thing. Especially it is most urgent at an early age. Because the adaptations are very rapid, the brain plasticity is high. Later on it will be slow. And therefore it was the prejudice accommodative isotropia is occurring only after the third year. Because the second requisite, that the angle should disappear with the glasses. It was in every case possible because the adaptation was slow. But if the accumulative isotropia is occurring at the fourth week of life or sixth week of life, then the adaptation is rapid. And if the glasses are not given immediately, relaxing the angle, two weeks later, it may be too late already. The adaptation has started. We give them the glasses naturally, but then we have also to give anti-adaptation reprogramming treatment. And this is a sort of occlusion. And this is the occlusion what we apply almost in every case. Because if you do patching, then you are having the danger that amblyopia occurs. I told at the Congress that I have nothing against this patching of babies if it is every minute taken on the other eye. And there was laughing. <laughs> it's impossible. How could you want such a thing? And we are doing this if the patching is coming here. And the baby is looking like this, alternating perhaps every minute. So the patching is continuous. The fixation is alternating. Here he is looking with the left, sometimes later he is looking with the, um, with the other eye. And we can tell the parents the goal of the treatment is equal use of the eyes. If you see that the baby is looking always with the left eye, then make it two millimeter more and take the two millimeter here down. This is a message for the brain, something is wrong with a better eye, now we should choose the other eye for fixation. If this happens, then the next goal is equal use of the eyes with equal segments. And then the parents can experience that the baby is using both eyes alternating. And by the glasses. You see here the sequence. Here. This angle with the super activity of the obliquus inferior can disappear. So when the angle is reduced and the eyes can look with the fovea, at first alternating. Later on, the brain is at a loss. Which eye should be sent away? One eye should be in any case. But which one? Let us try with the right. And the right is telling, what? I should go away? No, I am better than the left. Oh, no, <laughs> it, is, it, uh, <coughs> it is impossible. I am not going away. And then the brain is telling, should I work with both of you? What should be the answer? But it is a difficult answer. In every case, when we have already a 
straight eyes for distance. I don't know whether <coughs> it is now here relaxing. Suppression stabilizes. No, we have to go farther. So when the eyes are straight for distance, there is always isotropia for near, present. Why? It is because the suppression is always stronger for near. And we will uh, speak later on how <coughs> can be uh, treated this condition. But here we see the adaptations, every sort of adaptation of the anomalous correspondence to the initially intermittent isodeviation. Where is a strain of accommodation and effort and exertion with the relaxation changing. And the relaxation will be shorter and shorter. It disappears, not relaxing completely at first. The microstrabismus, a small angle, is remaining. Now the, the angle is variable. The second. And at last, the variable angle will be smaller and smaller. It will be perhaps a smaller but static angle. There is not relaxing at all, only the effort, the exertion of the accommodation is constant. It cannot be stopped. The same thing is with the accommodation. You know, if the accommodation is used for a long time for distance, you cannot relax it by glasses. You give it cycloplegic to, to, to know at all, is there any hypermetropia? And the accommodation is returning after the cycloplegic effect is worn off. You need, if you give only a, a one-day acting cycloplegic action <coughs> agent, then you need perhaps 30, 40, or 50 days to give one drop until the accommodation is relaxing and accepting the glasses. With atropine, as we are giving it, you need not to give every day, but one week, one day, <coughs> one week, one drop of atropine is enough always in one eye, only in, into the dominant eye. The squinting, the deviating eye is suppressed. The dominant eye should be treated with the cycloplegic. The dominant eye is, has, has the, the dominance. So we are speaking with the dominant eye by the message of atropine and by the glasses. Relax. And these are the, the three adaptations, suppression, shift of localization. The squinting eye is seeing everything there where the dominant eye is seeing. Have you heard already shift of localization? And if it is stabilized in eccentric fixation, then the this localization is telling this this uh, water is not there, but it is there where my other eyes is. So I am grasping beside. This is the shift of localization. It, it stabilizes the angle. It, help, it is helpful for the brain. The adapted, the adapted condition should be stabilized. And the third is the convergence used for distance will be also stabilized if it is not relaxing anymore. If you give injection of Botox, we heard also in Vancouver about this, <coughs> the oculinum is the other name, I don't know which is uh, the most 
Bartholinum, yes, yes. It is showing that the angle is not fixed. It can be relaxed. And it remains relaxed after the botulinum injection for some time. But then it recurs. Because the program is telling convergence for distance is good. This is the program built up in the intermittent stage already. So the adaptation are acquired step by step. The resistance is the result. And the resistance of the angle was interpreted in strabology up to this day. It is still so interpreted that the origin is changed. Something other, some other disease, perhaps a virus or lepra or something other, is coming in and the angle is not accommodative anymore. The angle is accommodative of the origin but its relaxation quality is not the same as it was at this stage. So the surgeons who operate the static angle do not know at all that they operate an accommodative a, a isotropy of accumulative origin stabilized by delay is it clear? it is not partial accumulative isotropia there is not non-accumulative isotropia all isotropia is accumulative of origin and not relaxing by the adaptations of the brain this is my theory, which is the foundation of the prevention. Therefore, all isotropias could be prevented before the adaptation is making the relaxation non-present. Causes purely accommodative. What is your answer? Yes or not? Could I... <coughs> Perhaps I cannot convince you, but if you are trying yourself, you can convince yourself. This is the best. By early glasses. <coughs> so the early isotropia is at this age, starting the late at these years. And the hazard deviation disturbs the child. The adaptation is slow. And the child is happily getting rid of the isotropia with the glasses. Not so at the early age. The child is happy to have, uh, to have invented the isotropia. I'm seeing much better with one eye. And now with these glasses, I don't see at all away with it. You see, we are working against the will of the child, not against the will of the infant, because the infant has no will yet, but against the will of the child. And even the good glasses will be discarded, because it disturbs the method Im Im invented by the child to help itself by accommodating for distance and also converging for distance, rapidly adapting against the disturbance. One eye is disappearing by the suppression. And so the child is happily getting rid of the glasses. Not so as it here. The parents should know about this. <coughs> the child is not discarding the glasses because it is not good. The child is thinking the glasses is not good for my squint. And it is correct. So here is again summarized. What does it mean not relaxing? And we have two, two, two choice. Is it acquired adaptive resistance or is it partially accommodative origin? 
that every infant gets a second disease if it is not treated with glasses. And this second disease is causing the not relaxing angle. But if we are giving the glasses immediately, the second disease is prevented, which is adaptation. So, and if it is already started, it can be reprogrammed by anti-adaptive measures. Now the baby, you see the right eye is converging. And danger of waiting. The diagnostic error. What I mentioned as partial and non-accommodative isotropia, it is a diagnostic error. But it is so common that nobody is perceiving it. Is it so? Everybody is accepting the accommodative causes a partial only. It is mixed. Mixed with what? Not with another disease. It is mixed with adaptation. Permanent suppression already starting with intermittent isodeviation. Now this is perhaps an the child showing when the isotropia is already disappeared for distance, but it is present for near. Then we take down one segment of the deviating eye. For the near, it is deviating. And we are taking down the segment. And we are leaving the segment on the dominant eye. You see, the child is using this eye. And we can give also to help the segments atrophy in this eye, then the child is seeing for the distance better, but not for near distance. The glasses are not correcting for near, and the atrophy, the cycloplegia, is preventing near fixation, and then this eye is taking over the fixation after some weeks, after some months, the dominant eye will be here. And it, can be, it may be necessary then either to give this nasal segment on this side, but smaller as it was, because the, the isotropia for near is appearing already nearer and nearer. And the segment will be also smaller and smaller until it disappears if the overconvergence is appearing only already here, so near. And you told about uh, bifocals, as I heard. Now my experience with the bifocals is so that the most bifocals what I have given or I have seen were really under correcting in the upper part with some time. And I ended with all my 36 bifocals, which I ordered, so that the lower part was worn fully. Because the cycloplegia is not showing all the latent hyperopia. There is a stabilized form of latent hyperopia which is not reacting on cycloplegia, which is reacting only on wearing the glasses and repeated cycloplegia, so that the bifocal glasses are not necessary if you are caring that the upper part should be always fully correcting. And it means that temporary it may be overcorrecting because the accommodation is used for distance the glasses are then overcorrecting. If the accommodation is relaxing for distance, then the glasses are fully correcting or even undercorrecting later on. And this is my experience with the bifocals. And here we see a very important curve. Birth, second month, third month, fourth month. 
And this is a factor, a number, which is the multiplicator of the delay. If the squint was starting at second month and there was one month delay of treatment, then we need about 15 months reprogramming. It is not prevention. It is preventing already further adaptations. But the adaptation which was taking in this month delay, it has to be reprogrammed. It cannot be prevented. It's already too late for this. And in two months, it can be already irreversible, because who is waiting four years to <laughs> reprogram a squint, which was, which was adapted in two months at this early age? So at two months starting, two months waiting, four months, it's already Ciancia syndrome, fully. Later on, when the squint is starting here, the factor is only two, if I see well. So two months delay needs four months reprogramming treatment. And this is showing the curve, the most sensitive and the less sensitive. The most sensitive is the so-called sensitive phase of bifoveality, not the monofoveal sensitivity. With amblyopia, we are speaking about monofoveal sensitivity, and it can be seven years or eight years <clears throat> when it is irre irreversible. The bifoveal sensitivity is much more sensitive. It is much more urgent to be treated, bifoveal vision. It is preventing the anomalous correspondent, the microtopia, Ciancia syndrome and all these complications, vertical deviations, which are DVDs coming eight or nine months if there is no treatment. If, <clears throat> if we are waiting, where is the DVD? It is uh, missing. It should come. And when it is here, then we can have one more indication for more surgery. So you see, the child is uh, uh, looking for near and still <laughs> looking with the left eye. And the strength of the fusion, we are speaking always of the fusion, of the strength of the fusion, but I think we should think more on the suppression. Because the suppression is the agent, is the suppression is the answer of the brain, which is the opponent of the fusion. The most deep disturbing fovea region will be most suppressed. So the disturbing provocation is causing permanent suppression. Now you see here is the angle getting smaller. This is after two months, it may take a year until the bifoveal position is maintained for near also. And uh, the parents have not to come every, every month. They <coughs> can come every third or fourth month about because they are already familiar with the <clears throat> with the aspects, they know already what I will tell them. So I am asking now, what are you advising? What should I tell? And then they, they, yes, we should take again one millimeter down. Exactly, you should do this. And so <clears throat> we are then finishing the treatment in consent with the parents, always. Now this is not so important. This is another case. This was uh, this. This should be the first when the <coughs> eyes are already straight for distance. And these are again the three adaptations: at first suppression, second shift of localization, 
and the third, tonus stabilization. So this is, is there pathology at the onset of the isotropia? Is there any pathological? I think pathology was supposed erroneously. <coughs> it was not looked upon before the symptoms arrived. Was there any pathology? The pathology was created by delay. And prevention with really early glasses is possible. Really early means this. So is it really early when we are giving glasses with fifth month? No. It may be already too late. Not in, <coughs> in uh, numerous cases, but if we want a secure prevention with almost every case, then we need the prevention to do it in this age, in this early age. Now it is again the sensitivity. Here is in the delay. And here is the speed factor of resistance development in German and in mathematical form. Now, is here anything what is not understood in this uh, sensitivity and, uh, and the importance of this age? Here is no problem anymore. There is no adaptation. Now this was a <coughs> discussion with Jamposki and Gobin. Have you heard already Gobin, who is operating against the glasses to get rid of the glasses? And it is very good, the first week after the surgery. What's happening later on? many cases. I've seen them. And John Polsky is giving over minus, over minus glasses. This is the opposite as, in, as we are giving over plus in isotropia and then in isotropia giving over minus. <coughs> if the child is accommodating for distance forced by the minus, then the isotropia is diminishing or even disappearing. The problem is in the suppression. The suppression is not going so quickly away. <coughs> and you have to look always at this. I am doing never over minus on the suppressed eye. It is important to know which eye is the dominant, which eye is the suppressed, the mostly deviating eye. And I do the over minus only on the dominant eye. At first one, then later another, I am going with minus six over minus. And I have only two exocases, they are looking like this, who are not able to fixate. <coughs> one was called a Kogan syndrome. Because the child was unable to bring the eyes from the externus <clears throat> from the external angle to bring it in. <clears throat> and uh, she had no refractive error at all. I gave minus two, and now half of the time the eyes are straight. The mother is coming from Frankfurt, 500 kilometers. And uh, we will see how it will work. The <coughs> Kogan syndrome is a supposed paralysis of all eye muscles. And now it is evident it is not Kogan syndrome, but it was an extremely lazy fusion. <laughs> extremely lazy. He was looking like this, she was looking the baby like this, or like this. All the time. Not moving the eyes. And with their glasses, 
she was compelled to do a little bit moving at first and more and more moving with the time going on. Now this is the same thing, this is again the a suppression shift of localization, tonus stabilization, depends everything of pliancy of behavior, plasticity, what is the better word? Plasticity or pliancy, what, what is more accustomed here in the United States? Plasticity. Yes, then, then this was the European use only. Then let's go. This is again a baby, binocular perception depends on brain program, not on muscles or tendons. Now here's a family, father, mother, and what do you think, was it inherited and given, given at an early time? This is the Coggan syndrome, I think. Now already looking with both eyes. The mother is tired after 500 kilometers coming. <laughs> No, you see, here's the baby squinting again. Mother is now a little bit awakened. It is also without glasses, with glasses. Without glasses. So, this was. Now, if you have questions, there are so many sides of this problem because it is all controversial, it is not proven, it is true. It is proven only for the parents who are coming with the baby and seeing how it works. Yes? Since babies uh, of that age, really their, their whole world is, is so close to them, uh, if you look at the full cycloplegia, can you go plus two over that or plus two fifty or plus now, three? Now, wait, wait a bit, <coughs> you are speaking perhaps to rapidly. Tell it again, please. Okay. The babies, uh, the two and four month old, everything they look at is, is very close. It's almost within the distance of the arms. Um, if you look at only the full cycloplegic plus, that's really a distance correction. Should you not go stronger, use the, the plus yes. on top of that on, in, in all cases? I understand. But in this case, you are supposing that a near convergence, a near accommodation should have been dangerous. Then we would have isotropia cases with emetropia. And I have never seen. I have seen exotropia only. So I am not caring what the baby is doing for near, if I know that he is relaxing for looking distance perhaps short time, trying just. But if he tries to look for distance, should be relaxing. And if he cannot relax for distance, then it is danger for far and for near also. And for near is the, the more uh, danger because you can show it easily, more easily that for near you have overconvergence, perhaps for distance straight. But the cause, the cause of the deviation is at distance. Using accommodation and using convergence for distance as well. Accommodation is used very easily for distance. Convergence <coughs> is uh, used only if the fusional check is given up. So I, you are right important thing is every, uh, <coughs> only for the near, for the baby, which can be grasped, but the danger is not relaxing for distance. And uh, also the very important E, C and A quotient. It is a very big change if you give cycloplegia. The quotient goes up. 
if you give phosphorine yodid, corrosion goes down. And these changes are much bigger than you have in normal population. So I don't believe that this quotient has any role in the etiology of isotropia. Because then emetropic children with a high quotient could be squinting. Never. Only latent hypermetropia is not corrected. And a second question, part, part of the question is, what, in, in your practice, what is the smallest hypermetropia that you've seen squinting? Oh, yes, yes. That's a very important question. It is only a question of statistics. I don't know whether it is once in 10,000 or once in 100,000, but I have a baby who was squinting with one plus, and he was giving up the squint with one plus correction. It may be one of 100,000, but if it is so, I am sure it wasn't more. It was only one dioptery. It's enough. And I have seen one child with an anisometropia. One eye was emetropic, the other was plus one. And the plus one was amblyopic, without squint. <laughs> he didn't use it <laughs> because of the one. They are extremely lazy accumulative and extremely lazy fusion sometimes. This is the individual difference. It may be hereditary as well. Perhaps <clears throat> not only the refraction, but also these, uh, these features of uh, fusion, suppression, all functions of the brain can be also hereditary. So this is my experience. Once in 100,000, so I can never guarantee the parents if they are coming with a baby and I'm finding two diaptic hypermetropia and I give no glasses but I cannot guarantee that the child will not be squinting for this case I tell always that I am not giving the glasses because 95 from 100 should be superfluous but if your child will squint with these two diapters, immediately come and the squint will go away with the two diapter correction. Perhaps this is the correct answer. And it is, it is difficult, as a, a Polish colleague made a, a proposal in Brussels in 1954, Every baby should wear a glass, and there will be no strabismus. Yes, he is right, but what will we tell the mothers? <laughs> and every mother will be crying. And I heard already from a patient who was telling that I was, I was told I should not go to Riti because he's crazy. He's giving every baby a glass. And I, I take care that this is not happening. So I give now glasses about three and a half, four. This is the starting. When I don't see any sign of squint. Because then the danger of starting isotropia, of starting emetropic, uh, intermittent isotropia, is about 50%. So every second glass is still superfluous. But I do some superfluous glasses, but I don't like superfluous surgery. Will you repeat that? <laughs> yes. I... I give sometimes superfluous glasses. I'm aware of it, but I don't like to make superfluous surgery, not a single one. Yes? Uh, 
you speak more of Kogan's syndrome? Kogan? Yeah. Yes, this diagnosis was made uh, when the baby was three months old in uh, the University Eye Clinic Gießen. And uh, the head, throwing of the head, Kopfschleudering, this was the, the basis of the diagnosis. But the child was lazy only. And later on, when <coughs> you have seen, she was using the eye muscles. This is Cogan syndrome. It is very rare. I've never seen. This should be the only one, but this was also not. I don't know whether it is, exists or not. In this case, surely not. But we are waiting uh, <coughs> perhaps a half year before sending back to the University Eye Clinic. Now look at the uh, Cogan syndrome, because uh, there were many uh, operations indicated whether it is still indicated or not. I think they will be shocked that a baby who is emetropic should wear minus glasses. It is my experience that after many years the minus can be <coughs> taken down as the fusion is getting stronger and stronger. Whether it can be given fully up or the accommodation used for distance is already stabilized that perhaps minus one should remain. But it is unimportant. Yes? I don't think you've uttered the word prism. Prism? Yes. Oh yes. Prisms. Prisms, yeah. Yes. The prisms have two effects. One is the motor effect, and the other is the sensory effect. And it depends on the child which will be taken from the two. And mostly, it is the motor effect. The sensory is too strong, it will not be changing. So that if you are giving uh, prisms against animal's correspondence, the prisms will be eaten up by the anomalous movement. But, but if the anomaly is not strong, then the prisms can have a sensory effect. And in this case, are the prisms good? I tried quite a, a long time prisms, overcorrecting prisms, with the method of Madame Pigasso. The patients were not um, much liking it. So that I do now only this uh, binaural segment. It is much more simple. It is more inexpensive. And the patients are liking it more. So many patients have gone away with the prisms and didn't come back. That's a problem, which is <coughs> always, uh, <coughs> always uh, showing the treatment is not chosen only by me. The treatment is chosen by the parents. And I have to respect it. So if you have a, <coughs> if you put on the, the full compensating uh, power for the refraction, and you have a residual angle. Then I do the occlusion. But no prism at all. You don't, don't if a perhaps uh, I would do it if it is a, a wrist vertical angle because there is no hope that I can uh, resolve with. Then I am helping the fusion with a small vertical deviation and a small vertical angle. Yes? Have you done any work or tried Fresnel, either Fresnel prisms or Fresnel plus lenses that you can cut up to the shape of the, the eyeglasses and then move them back and forth to see if that has any... Yes, the present, present. For, for Fresnel. 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 Little, the cut out of that, the plastic. Yes, yes, I did this. And what were your results with that, looking at that? 
it was so that it depends on the animal's correspondence. And the animal's correspondence is too strong, then it doesn't happen. And it depends again when was starting the spin. How early? With a late starting spin, it may be good. With an early starting, not good, because it is driving up the air. And at 
first I thought we can't come over the problem. But when the party was phony, I will be mad. I cannot give. Either am I mad or the child is mad. And then I told a new method. Sometimes you have perhaps a, a little bit itching on the lips. It is very good if you do it like this. But care for the angiophilia should be a little bit of atrophy. And if you make like this, you should touch the colon diva. And this is not for a week. Take care not in your own eyes. <laughs> child was uh, grateful for so careful, carefully managing his uh, itching eyes. I have now about three or four such children who are not wearing the glasses at all without atropine and not wanting the atropine drops either. So this is the only method we can, we could have for three weeks or four weeks once a week or twice. Sometimes you can do it every day. Earlier we had been giving three times a day. Before giving the glasses. I am not giving anymore. I am giving the atropine when I can help also the effect of atropine. The glasses. See better for distance. Minus plus over then again, for full correction within, within a quarter hour. And it remains for him. For the near, it is the uh, worse. The child is not seeing so well, but then the child is using the other eye, the umbilical cord, for near. So, yes? Do you use atropine for the initial cycloplegic refraction? Atropine for initial? No. No, because it, <coughs> the cyclo, it is called cyclotropin in Germany. It's working more quickly and more and uh, about the same. Of course, and usually, if I have a strong isotropia, I give more glasses as I was measuring in cycloplegia, because I know the next weeks or next months are bringing more latent hyperopia and I am doing it more quickly if I give already now a stronger glass. And the problem is, if you are giving under correction, then the accommodation will be used always for distance. And this accommodative capacity is missing for near. And so the infants who are undercorrected may be under-accommodating for near. It can make a bigger convergence angle. So the, the treatment of the cause <coughs> is to give stronger glasses to make free the accommodation from using applying for distance. Accommodation should be used only for near. Only. And the <coughs> accommodation used by the infants for distance should be eliminated with the glasses. Yes? How do you respond to your colleagues who um, say, you know, infants don't see well when they're less than a year old, or infants don't see very well when they're less than two years of age when they have over 60. Acuity, for example, how can they respond to those accommodative lenses or <coughs> the, the convex lenses if they don't see well? Their uh, retinas aren't mature, they're not seeing well, so why put glasses on? How do you respond to that? I understand. You mean <coughs> the amblyopia should be present? Uh, no. The fact that, say, for example, with infants, they don't see very like adults. Yes. And if they see, for example, 2200, the 
the just noticeable difference of a lens with 2200 acuity might be yes. three or four diopters. But it is the following. See means experience. Is it? If you can't if you can't make the difference between an elephant and a mouse, are you not seeing well or you have not the experience? I think in the case of the baby, the experience is missing. But we are giving the glasses not for seeing well, but to learn to see well. And for this, you need the full correction. And if the baby has now 20, 20 to uh, 200, in one year, I am sure, we'll have 20 to 20 with the full correction. But if the child is squinting, if the child is not corrected, it may be remaining like this, and deprivation, amblyopia, amblyopia from strabismus can be there. But I think seeing is experience, like French speaking is also experience, and Spanish also. <laughs> so that it, to learn the speech, you have to be put in the in environment where you can do it. For French speaking, it's best to go to France. And for seeing well, it is best to put the full glasses on. I think that, uh, is it uh, logic? That I don't care what is seeing the child now, I care what will the chi child be seeing in one year. Yes? What? In certain types of cases, though, you might have a response to the angle with less power, such as a plus six zero, you may put a plus three to get alignment now. What's your feelings about using uh, less power, but having a stabilized angle there, and then following it down the road, and then putting more plus on it, if appropriate? Yes. You, you mean such cases where the fusion can be res, res, uh, restored with three diopters already, and the fusion is there. Then, <coughs> then uh, the danger is perhaps so that if the child gets fever or a stress or a trauma, it may be squinting again with the three, but it wouldn't squint with the six diopters, full correction. So that uh, the risk is lower if you are giving the full correction, <coughs> but uh, the tree may be sufficient and practically perhaps done very frequently. Because you, to know the full, the total hypermetropia is not an easy thing. Even <coughs> before the child was using accommodation all the time, and it is a big difference to accommodate for near, so, so, or so, or so. It is always different amount of accommodation. But if I have three diopters, hypermetropia, I apply always three diopters accommodation for distance. And this is a sign for the brain. This should be done automatically programmed. So if you sleep, it should not be relaxed. Because if you are awakening suddenly, you should see well already. And the program is doing this. During the sleep, you have the program accommodation activated. It doesn't disappear during sleep. And to relax this accommodation is very difficult. You cannot do it uh, from one day to the other. So the most frequent case is that you have five diopter hyperopia, you give three or four, and if the squint is gone, I don't care how much is the total hyperopia. My aim, my goal was not the full correction of total hypermetropia, but to make the squint disappear. But I tell, if you see again recurring isotropia, at first intermittent, come immediately, we may need more glasses. 
and this was the case about 10% of prevention in uh, <coughs> infants of squinting parents. We made the cycloplegia as usual with one or two drops. We gave the full correction and 90% didn't squint. 10% was beginning to have intermittent isotropia wearing their glasses. Not that they have not been wearing or what. They have been wearing very well and, and starting again the intermittent isotropia. And in such cases we have been finished up to plus three more as the initial correction was until the recurrent intermittent isotropia was disappearing. So this is the most difficult problem how to know what is the full hyperopia. Perhaps it is uh, the first three weeks of life when you could measure it. I have seen already fear four months old babies I'm doing always two times retinoscopy. At first without drops. And there was no squint and there was emetropia or minus uh, uh, 0.5 with the retinoscopy fixating for one meter. And uh, giving one drop of cycloplegia and it was plus six. So the child was already learning with four weeks, four weeks, not four months, was already learning how to accommodate against this hyperopia, how to make it disappear, and not squinting. So the fusion must be very strong. But it is uh, not uh, uh, secure. The fusion will be immediately destroyed if the child has fever, high fever. Immediately disappears and the squint comes in. And then you are telling the squint was coming because of the morbidly inoculation or something or other. No, no. The accommodation was working all the time. There was a constant stress, a, a constant strain. The fusion was uh, uh, checking it. And then suddenly, no, no fusion. Screen was appearing. There are always uh, risks. The most secure is to do it early and to do it fully. Yes? Oh. <coughs> After you've reestablished fusion with these youngsters, how long do you have them wear? Oh, yes. Before you start reducing. Yes, that's, that's a, a, a very interesting problem which cannot be solved immediately because it depends on parents, on the infant. I had an interesting uh, experience that a professor in Switzerland who was uh, my president when I was giving a paper in, in Austria didn't me allow more than 10 minutes and then <coughs> made abruptly finish. And two weeks later he's phoning me, Reti, what did you tell about, about this infant squinting? My grandchild is squinting. <laughs> <laughs> and on this day he was calling five times more, the optician also, and, and ho ho tell you everything ag again. I wasn't uh, uh, giving much <laughs> attention. <laughs> But this is now my grandchild, then it is different. It is different. And this child was wearing then the glasses until the eighth month. And then he didn't wear it at all. And he <coughs> the screen didn't recur. So I don't know when when you take it down with one year. How many will recur? If you take it down with two years, it will be less. If you take down with three years, it will be again less. So I don't know what is the border. I tell mostly 
two years now to wear and I add one later on when it is worn very well <laughs> for more secure procedure but the <clears throat> glass should not be thrown away if the squint is recurring put it on immediately but a squint starting with four years is never so difficult you recover it immediately fusion is coming back Suppression is not so strong. If it, if it was not a microtopia, which is... My approach has been to taper or uh, decrease the power. If there be yes, this is all. You yes, this is the usual. Because the, the <coughs> hypermetropia is also less and less. By growing, the, the bulb is, is growing, and uh, two, three diopteries less is the usual. Sometimes it is going over into myopia. And then we have to take down. Sure. And if it is only one dioptria, one dioptria or, or, or one and a half, then we can make abruptly. Now you wear it only when you are reading. Yes, but this is an, an interesting problem. It depends from the parents also. If you give the glasses earlier, you get rid of them all the time. The scuffle was built early, and the concrete is strong. without uh, scaffolding for some time and, and an earthquake was making everything <laughs> shaky, then you have to wear uh, to take the scaffold uh, 10 years before it is superfluous. Yes? Uh, I think there's another, I agree with you on the early prescription, that's correct. Yeah. There's another very important reason for prescribing early. And I've had the experience where I've suggested it, and even a pediatrician or somebody said, no, glasses are bad, don't, don't do it. And so they might have been originally plus four, and a third ESO. And then they said, the, the pediatrician said, leave it alone, it'll go away. Mm. And I said, don't hold your breath, it goes away. And so a year later, I come back and they said, yes, you were right. Now put the glasses on. Now you find that in the fixing eye, plus 250, and the embryonic guy plus 4. Mm -hmm. You end up getting so this, and I saw that. You end up getting this mm -hmm. increasing anisotropia by not prescribing. So that's a very important reason yeah. as well. The early prescription winds it up, prevents, like you say, the amniopia, yeah. yeah. and prevents the development of this anisotropia. To the prescribed delay causes, but it is not uh, in, in, uh, taken in the list of uh, medical, uh, what's called the uh, mistakes. There is a list when, yes, malpractice or, or if it is not voluntarily done, this is the, the there is a sort of, of expression for it. It's always some percentage of medical uh, errors, so the prescribed delay is <laughs> also this. Iatrogenic. Yes, yeah, iatrogenic. Yes, yes, this is involuntary. It's not voluntarily, but it is occurring. Yeah, decision. If with your plus and atropine, uh, you get intermittent trophy, at that point you would keep the nasal occluder on? 
I keep it on. And I have to see which eye is uh, being suppressed. And uh, occlusion should be anti-suppressive. Because the suppression is the only cause of weak fusion. Fusion is never weak. Fusion is always strong. But the suppression is even stronger. And therefore, <clears throat> to look always where is the suppression, where can we eliminate it? We cannot eliminate it, but we can weaken it. And I tell the parents with their glasses, you see, the glasses are against the deviation, but the child is for the deviation. And his brain is also working to keep up the deviation. And what do you think, which is stronger? The brain of the child is stronger. And we can only go against this very strong enemy with a continuous wearing of the glasses. So if you take the child in the evening to the bath, you can take every clothes, but not the glasses. The glasses are a part of the body. The brain should not know that I need the accommodation for distance, I need the isotropia, even for a quarter hour in the evening. But this program is good. It should not be eliminated. And you have a squint one year long, still intermittent or still variable. What's the cause? And then I was asking, how is it with baths evening? Oh, we, naturally we take it down. Now stop it, stop it. If you want to stop the visits for me, you have to stop to taking down the glasses. And now it was in three months, the squint was disappearing. And since this, uh, we are telling with every prescription of the glasses that no 10 minutes, no five minutes without the glasses. Because this is <clears throat> the program will be again reinforced. And the reinforced program, intermittently reinforced program is stronger than the continuously reinforced. It is a psychological <coughs> law. How important is it from your experience that the glasses be horizontally straight? Uh, with induced prism with high plus lenses, does that, uh, is that a factor if, the, if a child wears glasses crooked all the time? Yeah. I, I have no experience with this question. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe, yes, yes, yes. But we have, have very good opticians, and I have not seen yet such. I, I noticed one of your slides, the glasses were crooked. That's oh, I yes, know. yes. But it is only for some second, and it is changing always. <laughs> so it is a... It is quite a miracle how the parents are making it. <laughs> and I tell them that I cannot tell everything. You have to think yourself. It is your baby. And how you manage it, the baby is uh, having the result. And so it, <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is really not always uh, ideal. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, your approach is a very optimistic approach, and that's great. Uh, the ophthalmological approach here in the United States yeah. has generally been very poor in terms of that uh, we will cut the muscle line of the eye, but you will never get fusion. Yeah. At all. So we like your optimistic approach. I will take issue with you on one aspect that you spoke of before. I was pessimistic. And that is that the amblyopic eye is incurable after the age of seven. Yeah. I have made my living for 40 years curing amblyops, most of them 
over the age of six or seven. Mm -hmm. So what happened to the OPI? Can we restore it? In an empty apple guy, in 12 year olds, 14 year olds, 40 year olds, 50 year olds. So there is not that six or seven year old. Yeah, the it's a story. Yeah. I would take issue with you on that. Yeah. So the, the, the true situation is even more optimistic than what you were saying there. Yeah. So reconsider yeah. that, that caveat that you were offering that MLP is not curable okay. after six. Yes. It's not true. I, I have only uh, two or three cases where the child, the infant, was coming with nine months of age, and she's still amblyop. And she had on one side minus 11, and the other was plus one. She's still amblyop about uh, 0.5 vision. Yeah. Because not the contact lens, not the glasses, there was always anisometropia, there was always a small angle. And, and I don't think that this is uh, curable. In, this is also not preventable, perhaps. I don't know, because the infant was coming with nine months of age, and now she's uh, 13. But she's not uh, making any difference from that. She's uh, doing bicycle, she's doing ballet. <laughs> but she is only open to one eye, at least for the central region. Yes? Could you talk a little bit more about small angle uh, strabismus? Oh, yeah. After you correct them and you look, are, are we going to make a mistake and think that there's fusion and actually it's not fusion, it's small angle? Or does the, that, not, that not happen with a four and five and six month old? Oh, four and five and six yes. So if you have a small angle and not zero straight yeah. position, it is due to suppression. How do you test to see if it's a small angle yes. or, or I test it with moving uh, an object in the middle, nearer and nearer. And the suppression will be stronger as you come nearer. And you see saccadic convergence, over convergence, one great socket, or not coming out smoothly, dynamically. So the suppression is on this eye, which is doing this. And then we do a segment on the other eye. And then after one month, you see all these uh, symptoms changing on the other eye. At least it should be. If not, it has to be continued. And if it is changing on the other eye, then this is the dominant, then you can take a smaller segment on this eye. And so the small angle, it is in incredible, and Lang Josef would never believe me that we have seen many microstrabismus intermittent. Microstrabismus is never intermittent. It is congenitally stabilized. But Josef Lang was never seeing babies under six months because his opinion was, the, he told it in Cannes, the president said that, you know, babies with six months are the same as birds. And I was sitting behind in a dark room somewhere and I thought, my God, he doesn't know that the biggest changes in life are coming between birth and six months. But Joseph is still the same opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're using the test with a pen light or a flashlight? Yes, that you use pen light or we have a small, small uh, what is called uh, this, which is uh, frog, small frog which is squeaking. And we have a kangaroo, which is making like this. So small animals or small pen light, something which is taking the attention of the baby. And then looking at the eyes. The best would be to, to make a tracing. But I have not the instrument for making the tracing. So you have to have a very, very good observation.
to look for small circuits. With the early glasses, are you seeing more fusion or more small angle as the first? Um, a more small angle. More small angle. When a big angle decreases with your glasses or disappears, it is not true. It didn't disappear. It is always a small angle remnant. Because the small angle adaptation is the strongest, the most frequent, is the first, and is the last to go away. It is always the small angle. So you always have to do financial occlusion then? Yeah. <coughs> yes. If there is the small angle. Only the, the earliest class do talked about the bimesal occlusion and then when you feel they're straight you took off the, the one, one, one eye, the non-dominant eye. Yes. And how long do you uh, partially occlude the one? One year. Sure. One year. Okay. Sometimes six months, sometimes one and a half. Until the child is learning step by step making an effort. The treatment was, from the beginning, against effort, to relax. And now the child can relax for distance. And now we want, he should make an effort for one meter. And he's doing it, full power, one eye is going in. And then you have to take time, one year or so, to learn it step by step. Little effort, a step, so much effort only, and then so much, so much, so much, so much. It takes always some weeks until you arrive here, and then it is no problem. Then you can make the effort, but fine dosage, in a fine dosage, and you can relax. and. I was making a, a, an experience with babies which also Kans, Kans, uh, Kransky was uh, writing. Kransky. Kransky was writing. That the most secure method to overcome automatic strabismus is to learn voluntary strabismus. When I have the baby, or uh, when I have the infant, or, or the or child, four or five years, sometimes intermittent, sometimes not. Then I tell, now with the glasses, you should squint. <laughs> and then they are not knowing how to squint. And then I show, look at your finger, or look at my finger here, and now keep it on without my glasses, without my fingers. The glasses are on. Keep it on. Now imagine that I have the fingers here and then keep it so. Now stop it. Relax. Now make it again. Relax again. He was writing the same thing in his book. And when the infant, when the child has learned how to do voluntarily squint, and how to do, relax it voluntarily again, he can do the same thing without glasses. Because he feels where, where is the, the key for squinting, where is the key, key for not squinting. He finds it. It takes a, a long time. I, I was trying this only since half a year. But now I am happy that uh, the Washington optometrist is employing the same method. <laughs> to learn squinting voluntarily. It's not dangerous because you can always stop it. The automatic, you cannot stop. And this is dangerous. With um, <coughs> surgeons fail on occasion, we fail on occasion with vision therapy. On occasion? Uh, we fail sometimes with some patients. And in your years of seeing um, infants and children, could you give us some feeling for um, how
how often you fail with the methods that you described of using plus binasals and when you are through, how many of them wind up with uh, monofixation uh, versus a large angle where they might need um, strabismus surgery? So it is when you need the surgery or not, it is a subjective opinion because the surgery is not helping. The problem is in the brain. I wouldn't uh, have any, uh, any argument if you want to operate the brain in these cases. <laughs> but um, but what, what is to do on the muscles? <coughs> and uh, uh, when I fail or I have success, it depends when was starting the squint, how long was the delay, and I have many patients where I am sure that I have only a failure because the failure was done with the delay. It cannot be different. But surgery is in the same situation. Then we have the, the <coughs> oh, excuse me. Then we have the, the conservative treatment and not the preventive. Yes. And you know the conservative treatment can have any success between 5 and 85. It's okay. So this is the failure. It is pre-programmed. But I cannot tell the, the parent immediately you are already a lost case. Go away. Disappear. Yes, sure. Sure, I, I have a, at the beginning a, such, a, big, uh, such a, a big loss of uh, patients that I've given the first glasses and only three from ten have been coming back. Later on it was five, and now we have about eight coming back. But now I am telling always, as a prevention for the parents, that if you go to see other doctors, you can see nine of them, all of them will be against this treatment. So I can tell you now, and you are the responsible for your baby, and you have to, to think which can be good and which not, because this is just a new treatment, this cannot have the multitude, cannot have the, the, the majority on his side. We are in the minority. And it is your problem. But you can phone or you can ask now everything. Have you a, a, a question more? And then most parents are telling that we are trying your method because the surgery can be done later. And this is told with a big angle. And then I noted what the parents were telling, and one year later, now look at your child. Do you see anything what can be surgically done? Do you see any, any squint? Because it is a small angle, it is not seen always. No, then now you have uh, the uh, now you have the confirmation what was the good decision. The problem, you see, is still not at the muscles. The problem is that the infant is still sometimes choosing a big angle, sometimes a big. But the glasses are <laughs> again enforcing the straight position. Can you give me some feeling for if you've got a, a youngster Yes, if you, if you have these youngsters with, uh, with uh, uh, three and four months in treatment, 
then you have per perhaps 10% small angle. If they are already one year, then have 90%. <coughs> One of the things interesting is one of your articles I've read has talked about the success being like 50 percent or so, but that is that's misguided because out of that 50 percent, most of those just did not come in for follow-up, and they mm -hmm. ended up getting a different opinion and a surgical opinion. And so your success, you know, it's a big question about what the statistics no, are really saying. No, the statistic is only on the patients who are coming back. Who are, who are not coming back that they can't be, they are, they are just foreigners. They have been seeing me once and not doing anything. And now I have uh, written uh, an article, perhaps it is for pediatric ophthalmology, uh, <coughs> ophthalmologists, for pediatricians, that the infant came with a mother with a very uh, big angle, and high, high propia, it was six diabetes. We had one glass given back by other parents, giving the baby, and the screen was disappearing to the small hand. And two days later, the mother was phoning. I sent back to you the glasses. My husband has been looking through the glasses and has told it is too strong. <laughs> <laughs> so finish. I couldn't tell him.